Hi, everybody. My name is Linda Abraham. I'm the founder and president of Accepted. I've been a medical school admissions consultant since 1994, and I'm going to be presenting today's webinar. Before we get started, I want to encourage those of you, and I'll probably do this again a couple of times, who have not yet downloaded your webinar worksheet to do so. Um, it's a great way for you to follow along, take notes. Also, it's a way, I think, to really add value to the webinar by actually writing down to-dos. I mean, there's a, a place in the, in the worksheet just for that. A few items worth noting before we start. We'll have a cool contest towards the end of the webinar based solely on content presented during it. So stay tuned and you can win. If you've not yet downloaded your webinar worksheet, take a second to do so and print it out. Again, I think it will help you get the most from today's presentation. Number three, hand raising. I know you're all Zoom experts, but I'd like to uh, test your hand raising skill. Please raise your hand if you are attending this webinar because you want to become a physician, your dream career. Raise your hand if you want to become a physician and that's your dream career. Okay, well, most of you are here for the right reasons. That's good. Okay, and we're going to use the question window for you, your questions and have scheduled time for Q&A at the end. Also, a couple of consultants will be joining me. Um, please feel free to post your questions at any time during the webinar, and we're using the chat window for your answers to my open-ended questions. So again, your questions go in the question window. Your answers to my questions go in the chat window. Finally, I'm told that some people attending a webinar really are interested in the special that we sometimes provide at the end of the webinar. Uh, they're even anxious and that anxiety can take away from their focus and concentration. I don't want that to happen to you. And since we are having a special for, to, for today's webinar, for this webinar's registrants, I'm going to share it with you right now. $250 off any primary application package using coupon code SAVE NOW and $500 off any primary plus secondary application package. Again, the coupon code is saved now, and this fantastic special ends January 24th. Before diving into the heart of the webinar, I'd like to learn a little bit more about you. So the first question is, um, and here's the poll, where are you at in the application process? The options are planning to apply in 2022-23 or preparing for 2024 and later. Okay, so basically it's this cycle or later. Okay. And let's see. Oh, we're at 78% participating. Let's see if we can't get it over 80. Okay, five, four, three, two, one. Let's close the poll. And where are you at in the application process? And the results are 75% of you are planning to apply this cycle and 25% are preparing for a later application cycle. Okay, that's pretty much what I anticipated. Um, we welcome both groups, but it's, it's good to know which category you belong to, uh, what, what kind of what the makeup of the audience is. All right, we can stop sharing these results and post another poll. When you apply, whether it's this summer or later, will you be a first-time applicant or a re-applicant? Again, whenever you apply, will you be a first-time applicant or a reapplicant? All right, five, four, three, two, one. Let's close the poll. We have 75% participation, 80% are first-time applicants, and 20% are reapplicants. Okay, again, that's kind of what I expected, but um, okay, good, good to know. Let's go, go ahead. Are you gonna share the results? Or are you ready to share the results? All right, we're gonna go forward. Now, most of you are here because you want to get accepted to medical school in this upcoming cycle, so probably 75% of you, and you've done the pre-med thing. Raise your hand if you wonder if you have what it takes to get accepted to medical school at this point in time. Raise your hand if you wonder if you have what it takes to get accepted to medical school at this point in time. Okay, thanks. All right, about uh, a third of you, 25% of you are, are, are admitting to, to, the, to wondering whether you have what it takes. And uh, that's okay. I actually thought it would be higher. But if you're 
if we have a confident group here today, that's fine. Today, we're going to discuss the five essential ingredients of a successful medical school application. Include them in your application and your chances of acceptance are excellent. Leave off even one element and they are greatly diminished. All right, so let's, let's go on. Number one, you must demonstrate that you can do the work in medical school. Now, let me ask you in the chat window, please post, how do you intend to show that you can do the work required of medical school in medical school? In the chat window, please. Anybody want to venture a guess? How are you going to show that you can do the work? GPA and MCAT scores demonstrate can handle rigor of medical curriculum. Wonderful. Wonderful. That's certainly the best way. That is the most common way. Um, and it's usually the undergraduate GPA, though it might be a post back to master, master's. Exactly, Sandeep. Oh, I think I have some plants here. All right. The most common way, as, as Sanjana and Sandeep, Sanjana suggested, is through your undergraduate transcript and MCAT score. And that is presented in the primary application. And ideally, you want to be at or above average for exhibit students for both grades and test scores. If not, how can you convince schools to accept you? How can you convince them that you can do the work with, let's say, below average test scores? Okay. Um, and see if somebody here is already in a master's and an M SMP. Okay. Well, first of all, realize that averages are what they are because some are accepted with below average state stats. But the farther away you are below the average, and if both your grades and your MCAT are below average, the less likely it is that you can effectively demonstrate you can do the work. And I might add, compete effectively with your competition. So what, if you do, what do you do if you have below average grades? Well, you might do what uh, Emily and Sandeep have done, and that is enroll in a post back or a special master's program to show that you can do the work. This is if your science grades are below average, again, consider that post back program that will allow you to bring them up and perhaps also provide you with study, study skills enhancement. A high test score, a high MCAT can also mitigate um, low grades. And you'll see there are some resources for those of you who might be wanting to consider a post back program. Um, but again, if you, a high test score can, can mitigate the impact of low grades. For U.S. allopathic schools, you really want to be above a 511, um, above a 510, which would be a 511 or above. A five, uh, underneath 511 doesn't guarantee rejection, and above a 511 doesn't guarantee acceptance. It really is a more holistic process than that. But this is a rule of thumb. Obviously, to the extent you get a 514, a 517, a 520, more power to you. You increase your options and your chances of acceptance. But... I'm just trying to give you a rule of thumb and a, and a general guideline. You may also want to consider DO programs, which in general have slightly lower MCAT scores. And you need to apply to medical schools thoughtfully and purposefully. You want to apply to schools where your test scores and GPA are competitive and in range. So that ability to do the work that we started with, that's the first essential, right? Is generally evident in your transcript and test scores the seemingly objective parts of your application and also the presented in the primary. Now, the second essential, have a realistic idea of what you're getting into. You wanna show that you know what clinical practice is, have a realistic idea of what you're getting into, as I just said, and perhaps have some direction within medicine. You don't have to know the exact specialty or the address you want to, where you wanna have your office, but some direction is a good thing. Again, I'm gonna ask you, how do you intend to show this? In the chat window, please. How do you intend to show that you have some direction in medicine? Volunteering and shadowing, very good. Volunteer, shadowing and clinical volunteering, very good. Armando, Sanjana, Emily, you're right. That's exactly how you're going to do it. You have to realize that medical schools want to admit people who are committed to medicine. And that commitment, commitment must be evidenced by your experience in clinical settings. They want to know that you're not going to be squeamish on the side of blood and that uh, you can function when you do see it, that you're realistic about the demands and the hours of that physician's work, that you understand that not all patients are nice and not all outcomes are good. 
And this admittedly is harder to do given COVID, but it's not impossible. Hospitals still need, EM, uh, cities still need EMTs, hospitals still need phlebotomists, doctor's offices and hospitals need scribes. There are such things as mental health hotlines, there's contact tracing. There are things that you can do to show that you are committed to medicine, that you, you're attracted to it, and that you have an idea of what medical practice entails. Again, medical schools want to know that you can handle the workload, the emotional strain, and the sheer hard work. Now, I mentioned, do you have direction both in terms of your educational needs and your post-med school plans? The road to becoming a physician is windy. It has curves, it has dips, it has potholes. Yes, it also has some, some uh, wonderful views, but there are going to be those dips and potholes. And many secondaries are gonna ask you why you want to attend their school. Have you thought about the kind of education you want to have? Is it going to be problem-based learning, system-based learning, team-based learning? Are you more interested in primary care or specialties? Do your areas of interest match the school's focus and strengths? Are you interested in urban versus rural medicine? Um, primary care versus specialties? Research versus a clinical focus? Perhaps you already do have a, an idea of which specific specialty you want to go into. Do your activities and experiences reflect these interests? If you say, you know, you want to, I don't know, an example I usually do, do is save the whales and you've never been to the beach, it just doesn't kind of hold water. Your realism will come out in your essays, both primary and secondary, most meaningful experiences, the primary, secondary essays, letters of recommendation, and interviews, as well as just your activity uh, history and descriptions. So that's the second one, this realistic view. Second essential. The third essential show that you share the school's values and its mission. Now, the best place to do this is usually the secondary application because that is school specific. And the focus of the secondary application is on fit. Why do you want to attend this program? And why should they want you in their program? And sometimes the question is explicitly asked, why you want, why are you applying to the school? Other times it's a little bit more subtle, but it's definitely there. So how do you kind of show this fit? Well, look at the first start by looking at the schools and, and I'm talking now about individual schools, right? When you're doing secondaries, you have to respond to them individually. Look at each school's mission and values. Um, I've interviewed many medical school admissions directors and deans for admission straight talk. And you can see some of them on the screen right now. Uh, and if not, just go to the uh, URL there and you can listen to a whole bunch. I've never heard one say that what really differentiates applicants is their GPA and MCAT score. They don't deny that they're important because again, they wanna know that you can do the work. But the essays, the interviews, the most meaningful experiences, the secondaries, that's where they're going to get to know you. And that, and especially the secondaries, that's where you can demonstrate fit. So in your secondaries as essays and interviews, you should be able to discuss your experiences and draw from them the qualities that your target program values. So if service to the underserved, the urban underserved is a priority for the school that you're applying to and that you're applying to with that specific secondary, talk about your experience at an urban soup kitchen and how effective you were as a member of the food, food service team. If your target has programs in rural medicine and that's what you're interested in, talk about your upbringing in rural, pick your state, I don't know whether it's Georgia or Montana or Idaho and Arizona and your desire to settle there. If it's, if again, if it's true. And note that there's a difference between mouthing platitudes and spitting back websites and really showing that you share the values. The former, the spitting back and mouthing platitudes, it's just slate of hand. It still isn't convincing. It isn't real. And most adcom readers have excellent baloney sniffers. They'll, they'll, they'll just sniff it out that you're not being real. But if you provide examples in your essays, bullet points in your CV, uh, items in your activity description, description, your letters of recommendation and responses to interview questions must all demonstrate these qualities. And then you don't have to spit the phrases back at all. Now, if you have professional direction or think you know which area of medicine you want to go into, check out residency placement 
to select the schools that are strong in your area of interest, or at least include that as a factor in choosing schools. You can still change your mind, but if your current focus turns out to be your most desired residency, you may be ahead of the game. And again, it's one more way to show fit. A way to obscure fit is to focus on statistics, rankings, and forum rumors. Medical schools have among the lowest acceptance rates of any professional programs. They have lots of lots of applicants and they can be incredibly choosy. You need to know the school's missions and that school's plural mission and values in order to both show, choose the most appropriate schools for you and convince them to accept you. So again, fit with school's values is essential number three. Essential number four, demonstrate that be able to contribute to class discussions and teamwork, the school's community, and ultimately make the school proud. Now, if you're going to show that you will contribute in the future, what do you, I mean, is that just gonna be a claim you make? In the chat window, please, how do you tend to show that you are going to contribute? In the chat window, please. Community service. That's definitely one way to show. That's that's part of it. That's not exactly what I'm looking for. That's a good a good form though for what I'm gonna what I'm looking for. What you have to do, and again, community service is definitely a good place to do it, Sanjana, is you have to reveal a habit of contribution throughout your Your community can be very broad. Any group that you're part of and that you serve is your community. Um, so for example, it could be your neighborhood. That's what most people think of, your city. It could be an ethnic community, a religious community. It could be um, uh, affinity group, uh, political group, sports, arts. All those are communities that you may be a part of. And the difference between being a member and being a contributor or a leader is assuming responsibility for some outcome, whether it's a fundraiser, organizing event, um, just doing, doing more than be, being a nice person. But again, the differenti differentiator usually is assuming responsibility and it makes it more valuable from a admissions perspective. Now, it's increasingly important in medical school admissions that your community service includes service to the underserved. If your community is relatively affluent or not considered underserved, then branch out and make sure that you also do spend some time um, contributing to those who are less fortunate. Now, the non-traditional applicant may have extensive work experience to draw on that they can use to show a distinctive ability to contribute. And here's, here's what I mean. Let's say you were an engineer. You were, therefore, if you are an engineer, you are almost always a problem solver. And that might give you certain skills that are relevant to diagnosis and creating treatment plans. If you were a teacher, then you presumably have honed your communication skills and specifically the ability to, to explain complex subjects to people who were not previously exposed to them. If you're a team leader, an engagement manager in let's say a business setting, then maybe you can, you can talk about the leadership, the teamwork and the organizational skills that you develop in that context. Yes, people coming from non-traditional applicants coming from other professional backgrounds, have to show that commitment to medicine because otherwise why are you in, engaged in this and that realistic assessment of, of medicine and why, you know, why you're changing career paths now. But the fact that you have this non-traditional experience can be drawn upon to show both fit with particular schools and the personal traits, the qualities that schools are looking for. And we're going to get to those in a minute. Realize again that most medical schools have too many qualified applicants and many of the people rejected can do the work and frankly are accepted at other medical schools where they do just fine. If not formally, then informally, medical school admissions is a two-step process. Evaluation, determining the qualified, and there are always too many, and then selection, crafting a diverse class of committed, talented future physicians who will contribute both as members of the medical school community and beyond as physicians. 
And the implication from selection part of the process is yes, they want someone who can do the work. They want someone who shares their values, knows, has, has a realistic idea of what clinical medicine is. However, given the competition, that's just not enough. There's no reason to admit someone without something distinctive to contribute or someone lacking a record of past impact and contribution. You have to shine. So that's the fourth of the fourth essential. The fifth one, reveal the character that medical schools value. Now, in the question window, please, in the chat window, rather, got, whoops, blew that one. In the chat window, what character traits are med schools looking for? Compassionate, empathy, and caring for patient, good. Anybody else? Anybody, any other qualities that are important in medicine? Hardworking, yes, absolutely. Curiosity, willingness to, to, to learn, very good. Kailena, anybody else? You're, you're all right. Listening, excellent, Armando. Interpersonal skills, good. Sahani, great. Integrity, absolutely. Right, right, William. All right, here are a few others. Now, compassion, I think somebody mentioned that earlier on, right? Somebody mentioned, yes, yes. That was the first one Emily did. Compassion, humility, attention to detail, professionalism, teamwork skills, which kind of goes along with the interpersonal skills that Sahani mentioned, but not exactly the same. Cultural wellness, awareness, Carly has just added leadership. Excellent, Sahani. That was another one I was just going to say. Communication skills, both the ability to speak clearly and to listen well. All parts of the application must reveal these traits. And does not, again, it's not so much that you claim these traits, it's that the examples and the experiences you talk about show them. Now, they should, these traits should come through in stories you tell in your personal statements, the most meaningful experiences, the activity descriptions, the secondaries, the interview, whether it's traditional or MMI. And somebody mentioned leadership. There's no question that it's highly valued, but as is teamwork and the ability to work collaboratively. Now, in the question window, could you please provide some examples of teamwork that you've been involved in, and I'll, I'll comment on them. By the way, you can post your questions in the question window at any, any time. Actually, now we're getting, I said question window, I meant the chat window. But um, Sajana wrote, president of two clubs and vice president for one. Okay. Um, military veteran, Armando, excellent. Thank you for your service. Various mutual aid efforts. Research projects. Did you have leadership roles in those research projects, Kailena? SIDSA treasurer. I'm not sure what that organization is. But, um, you know, now when you're talking, we all work collaboratively. Good, good. Okay. I'm a flight paramedic and have worked collaboratively as part of critical care transport team for years. Excellent. Also a wonderful clinical exposure. Now, when you're describing this, you would also want to say how many people were on your team, depending upon how much space you have. You might, um, you obviously want to say how many years, how many flights have you been on? Uh, you know, give a little bit more um, substance to it. And Carly wrote, research team, standardized patient program, make a wish, wish grantor. Okay, must communicate with other staff and coordinate with, with uh, co-volunteers. Again, I would find out how many volunteers are you coordinating? I'd want to know that. Um, how many wishes have you been involved with? By the way, uh, my, my, anyway, let's go on, okay? Now, compassion and caring are absolutely required. Humility doesn't mean that you demean yourself at all, but it's definitely the opposite of arrogance, and it is required for effective teamwork. It means that you know your strengths, you know your weaknesses, and when someone can handle something more effectively than you can, you happily let them do that. You respect them, okay? And if somebody has a comment that you disagree with, you respectfully disagree. 
you uh, express appreciation, you share uh, credit. Attention to detail is reflected in the care you take on your essays and your applications. I interviewed uh, the assistant dean of admissions at SUNY Upstate, and she absolutely railed against the typos and lack of punctuation she sometimes sees on their simple secondary application. So folks, remember your application isn't Facebook, Instagram, WhatsApp, Twitter, or any other social media, Snapchat, or uh, you know, you're applying to professional school, show you're a professional. And speaking of social media, clean it up. There was a, a Kaplan survey a couple of years ago, it's probably more than a couple at this point, and 29% of medical school admission staff did check applicants' social media accounts and a majority found something that negatively affected an applicant's admissions chances. So in selecting the examples in your essays and interviews, choose those examples, experience, and anecdotes that answer the question and reveal these traits, most of which are also reflected in med school values in one way or another. So there's a lot of overlap between essential number four and number five, but they're not identical. And that's why I wanted to, to split them out. And don't make the reader think too hard. As Sydney Foote, accepted consultant since 2001, articulately laid out in her Nail Your Medical School interview webinar, Explicitly weave into your, into your anecdotes the traits that you want the schools to recognize. Don't rely on them to figure it out or come to the conclusion you want them to reach. Guide them to it. Tell them. One more way to show professionalism, commitment, discipline, and organizational skills is to apply early and respond to all secondaries quickly, promptly. Almost every medical school admissions person I have ever spoken with says apply early. Um, early generally means in June. Musical chairs, uh, uh, Ryan Gray once uh, was interviewed on the podcast, and he talked about medical school admissions being something like musical chairs. As the season rolls on, there are fewer and fewer seats available for interviews. With secondaries, you really ideally want to return them within two weeks of receipt, again, to, so that you take advantage of all the open interview seats that you possibly can. Do, as you do research on schools and applying, deciding where to apply, also, keep that research, keep your notes, so that when it comes to responding to secondaries, you have those notes available and can, can draw on them and then therefore respond more rapidly to secondaries. And also, use the time between the submission of your primary and the arrival of secondaries to pre-write the most common secondary essay questions or to pre-write the questions for the school, your in-state schools, or the schools you really, really want to apply to and are fairly confident of getting a secondary for. Most schools send out secondaries automatically without screening. There are some that screen. And they usually say so on their website. All right, let's go back to your goal. Get accepted this year and start medical school in 2023. Show you belong in medical school. So here's the contest I mentioned at the beginning. The first three people to answer the next question get a free consultation with an accepted consultant. What is, the first essential agreement in, what is the first essential ingredient in a successful medical school application? In the chat window, please. Okay, Roxana N got it. Emily got it. Um, and Sinjana got it. Okay. The first essential ingredient of a successful application is showing an academic track record that shows you can do the work. That's number one. Second essential ingredient, have the clinical experience and direction within medicine, which demonstrates a realistic perspective on what on your career goal, okay? Number three, show that you share the school's values and its mission. Number four, demonstrate that you'll be able to contribute distinctively to your medical school community and your profession. And then reveal the traits, the character traits, the attributes, that medical schools values value. And these are the five essential ingredients of a successful medical school application. 
and a little bonus advice to keep in mind. The admissions committee readers are sharp, intelligent professionals. Don't try to craft, fake, or fool. The best presentation of you is an authentic reflection of your achievement and dreams, keeping in mind the five essential ingredients of a successful medical school, school application. That's what you need to get accepted this year and start medical school in 2023. We're going to go to the Q&A in just a couple of minutes. I want to encourage you to post your questions in the question window, and I do mean the question window right now, um, as, as we move forward, okay? So my question for you now is, what is the most valuable piece of advice, information, or insight that you got from the webinar so far? In the chat window, please. What is the most valuable piece of advice, information, or piece of insight that you got from the webinar so far? Apply early. Okay, great. Leaving your personal anecdotes into your secondaries. Wonderful. Honest answers. Thank you, Armando. The application process. Suhani, thank you. Well, yeah. Okay. Actually, our next webinar, by the way, is when I, I go practically uh, month by month in terms of what you should be doing. Participation in community service. Thank you, Kailina. Have a realistic idea of what I'm getting into. Wonderful, Patrick. Okay, good. Importance of application timeline. Great pictures. Thank you, Armando. Importance of that you are able to work collaboratively with others. Wonderful. Um, are any of you feeling overwhelmed at this point? Raise your hand. few of you. Yeah. Yeah. A few of you are about uh, almost 25%. Mm -hmm. well, that wasn't my intention, but applying to medical school is one tough process. And uh, there's a lot, a lot of parts to it. I've spoken with hundreds, if not thousands of medical school applicants like you, and sometimes their parents striving to get into medical school and stressed at the work involved and Possibly, the possibility that they may not make a cut, at least not the first time or the next time. We here at Accepted know how difficult and stressful this process can be, and we're here to help you. Your goal is to apply confidently and successfully to the best programs for you. Now, you're at a crossroads now. You can take the do-it-yourself approach, or you can invest in your professional future. Every year, we work with applicants who talked to us a year earlier and decided after taking the do-it-yourself approach and getting rejected, that they would work with us and they would have been better off working with us initially. And so would you. Why? Our clients benefit from the know-how supplied by experts, applying their expertise to each individual client. No matter how hard I try in a webinar, and I try really hard, the advice has to be general. But when you work with a consultant individually, the advice is geared to you, you only, and it's specific. Given the complexity of the application process, the competition, and the stakes, you need a guide who knows the process inside and out and who can support you through this grueling journey. You need Accepted to be your guide. When you engage Accepted, you can access professional expert advice, experience, and objectivity. You can save time. You can apply with confidence, and you can apply successfully. We have the admissions experts, the guides, who can mentor you through the process so that you achieve your goal of applying confidently and successfully. Former admissions directors, staff members, post -back program directors who have been on the other side evaluating applicants and who can mentor you through the application process. Uh, our, our applicants, we measure different years, but typically they accept, the acceptance rate for the clients who respond to our survey are between 85 and 95%. Here's what I recommend you do now. Visit accepted.com slash primary. Choose the service that's right for you, or you can do it after the Q&A if you want. Get the guidance you need to apply the high-level advice I've given here to your specific situation to answer your specific questions. Go from confusion to clarity and from doubt to confidence. Now, some of you may say, isn't accepted ex expensive? Well, you know what? Rejection can be more expensive. Our fees are clear, but the cost of rejection is not quite as obvious or clear, even though it can be significantly higher than accepted fees. 
So let's take a look at the risks of not applying with accepted. It's on your screen. There's the cost of reapplication, which can be a few thousand dollars in application fees alone. And then there could be the cost of retaking the MCAT if you have to do that, which I'm sure most of you would prefer to avoid. A year of earnings at a much lower level than after you earn your MD or DO degree. And remember that year of earnings will actually come at the end of your career when you're likely to have the highest level of earnings. And then there's potential that you could have gotten into a better program with greater lifetime opportunities and potentially even earnings. But enough from me, what do accepted clients say? Here are a couple of testimonials on this slide. I've been loving my help so far. My consultant, Dr. Herman Gordon, has been very knowledgeable and helpful. Or I want to share my exciting news. I'll be attending the University of Washington School of Medicine. I received an email from the Dean of Admissions stating that I am awarded a hefty scholarship. I'm feeling blessed and excited right now. I want to thank you. This was for Alicia for your support throughout my application. I am so excited and relieved to have been accepted to California schools. I really appreciate all of Cheryl's help and input on my application. I feel much more confident in my personal statement after working with her. Thank you again. Hello, Sydney. Wow. This is another, another one. I'm so impressed. You are a genius. I, there are 17 more hours till the application is due, and I'm not stressed at all because I know I have you by my side with this essay. All right. We'd love to help you as we help these clients, the ones who wrote the comments you just saw and thousands of other clients over the last 25 years. So once again, this is what I recommend you do as a follow-up to today's webinar. Visit accepted.com slash primary, choose a service that's right for you, get the guidance you need, apply confidently and effectively. And again, the special that we have for registrants to this webinar is save $250 off our primary application package or $500 off our primary plus secondary application package. And this is only for webinar registrants. You will not see this coupon code or this, this special anywhere on the site. Um, and this expires on January 24th, this offer. So write down the, the details so that you can take advantage of it. And now for your questions, I'd like to introduce you to two of our top consultants who will assist me in responding to your questions. The first is Dr. Herman Gordon, also known as Flash Gordon, who is a former director of admissions at the University of Arizona Medical School in Tucson, as well as a professor at, the pro, uh, at that program and an accepted medical school admissions consultant since 2016. Dr. Barry Rothman uh, is also joining us. He founded and directed three post -bac programs at Cal State San Francisco for about 20 years before joining accepted staff in 2015. So let's, um, at this point, I'm going to turn on my video. Uh, Let's see. So you can see me. And gentlemen, you can do the same if you'd like. We can't turn on our video. All right. Um, Carly, can you get so they can? You might have to make us co-hosts. Yeah, I think I think Carly's doing that now. Okay. Thank you, Barry. Carly says she doesn't think she has the ability to make her. Oh, all right. Well, let me do it then. It's my mistake. Okay. Get this going. Okay. You should both have it, uh, Billy, now. Hey. Okay. Yeah. All right. Uh, wonderful. It's not working for me. I don't think you made me a co-host yet. Sure. Uh, you're right. Okay. You should be fine now. All right. Good to see you, gentlemen. All right. We have some questions here. What is the ideal time to take Casper slash Alta Suite? 
Gary, you want to take that one? Uh, I would say uh, to take it as soon as possible after you are invited by the first school to take it. Um, I wouldn't delay too long, but I'd also spend some time practicing. Um, there's some skills you may need to develop to give good answers, and hopefully you can type quickly. Okay, an anonymous attendee is asking, what is the price for the package? The um, primary application package is $2,615. $2,615, and go back up to that slide, which shows what is included. It includes basically all the advising you need on the primary, on one primary application. It's conducted, the advising is provided via email, phone, and video conferencing. It includes a one to two hour application strategy session, school choice guidance, um, a personal statement outline based on your brainstorming session, unlimited editing of the personal statement, consulting and editing for up to 15 activity descriptions, brainstorming and editing for the three most meaningful activities, uh, experiences, uh, primary application final review. And um, again, it's a flat rate service. Okay. And the primary plus secondary includes the primary plus secondary editing, advising and editing for up to eight schools and one mock interview. The, the, Two primary plus secondary package or the platinum package is includes all the primary plus secondary, but it's 20 schools, not eight. It's three mock interviews, and it also provides waitlist advice and, and uh, editing. Okay. And I, at the moment, I'm blanking on the price for the, the two secondaries. Carla, do you want to post those? Could you post those for me? Because I just don't just remember offhand. I don't want to mistake. All right, so let's see. Okay, now Emily asks, how do you determine mission fit? A lot of medical schools sound kind of the same. I found that information sessions tend to be more helpful, but not all schools offer them. That's actually a really good question. Um, I think that one thing I, I have found throughout my career is that schools complain that the applicants sound the same and applicants complain that the schools all sound the same. I'll tell you what, Flash, why don't you start that one? Okay, so no, tell me the question again. I'm, I'm not clear. Sure. Yeah. How do you determine mission fit? A lot of medical schools okay. sound kind of the same. I found that information sessions tend to be more helpful, but not all schools offer them. I think it's a good question. It's from Emily. Okay, so uh, some uh, admission sites are really good at giving you that kind of information. And you can drill down on them and you can really find a lot. Uh, other uh, school admission sites are awful and there's absolutely nothing there. Um, I have found uh, one really nice source is to look for student blogs from that school. And, uh, you know, I'd say, you know, one or two students out of every class blog about their experience uh, going through med school. And you really learn a lot from their perspective about uh, the atmosphere at that school. So. All right. Um, Barry, do you have anything to add? Yes. Uh, I think it, besides looking at the mission statement, look at all the details that are available on the medical school's website. Sometimes there can be something outside of the mission statement that could key you in on other aspects of their mission that they, they don't include in their mission statement. And I would say look at some of the special programs they have that, that may also cue you in on, you know, yes. if, if they have, again, if they have special programs for the urban poor, that would, that would give you an indication that that's something that that school considers important. If they're serving the rural, uh, you know, rural medicine, then that's something that that school considers important. Now, some have both, but, um, you know, that does indicate what they are proud of, what they consider important, and what their focus is. Hope that helped, Emily. Let's go on. Um, Armando asks, what are your thoughts on applying to Caribbean medical schools versus US medical schools for a candidate that is considered non-traditional 
in their 40s with a master's degree, but low bachelor's degree grades and zero prerequisites. What help, support, direction, and advice would you provide? Thank you. Um, Barry, I'm going to give that one to you first. Sure. Well, the part of Armando's question that stands out to me is zero prerequisites. Um, it's going to be hard to get into any medical school without the prerequisites. I actually had a client uh, many years ago who had, didn't have all the prerequisites, and it was just impossible to get into medical school. They, they absolutely insist on it. So I would say focus on that first. Uh, you can't avoid the prerequisites. And in fact, taking a few electives, upper division electives, uh, is essentially required to be a strong medical school applicant. Okay, great, thank you. Flash, do you wanna add anything to that? Uh, well, compounding that is, uh, it's either Armando or somebody else that he's talking about is in their 40s, so if they still have to get their prerequisites, uh, it's really too late. Uh, so you can still contribute uh, and have a career in medicine, just not as a doctor. So. And Sorry, what I about the whole question about Caribbean schools? I mean, let's 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 say that if if Armando had had the prerequisites, um, it would definitely be second choice to mainland schools. Uh, there are three that have uh, accredit accreditation, uh, and those would be the only three that I would apply to. So. Okay. Barry. Add yeah, be cautious with Caribbean schools. They're businesses, they make a lot of money, um, and they can be very difficult on first year students. Uh, many of them are weeded out early in the process. But if that's your only choice, then sure, go for it. But go for it knowing, knowing what you're getting into. All right. Um, all right. And then Kylina asks, and again, we welcome to post more questions. Um, any advice on how to fund medical school? Um, I don't remember who went first last time, but Flash, why don't you take that one? Okay. You can add. Uh, well, once you get in, they'll be very helpful. <laughs> um, so, uh, and I, I've noticed that a lot of schools, uh, even in their, uh, their Zoom interview days, are already uh, telling students about what kind of available funding there is. Um, it will largely be loans <laughs> and, and you will be able to pay them off because you're gonna be doctors. Um, but uh, it's really not something you should have to worry about too much. Um, there is a really interesting program uh, that's funded by the federal government where if you uh, agree to serve in underserved communities, uh, they will pay for your medical school, uh, at least for the tuition, and <clears throat> you pay back an equal number of years uh, in an underserved community that the federal government uh, uh, contributed to. Um, and I've known several uh, med students who uh, have gone through med school that way and absolutely loved it. You know, it was, I think because, the military has a similar program. Right, yes. the military has a similar one, yeah. Yes. So for people with those interests, that, that's, that's definitely the way to go. Barry, do you have anything to add? Yes, the, uh, the military also makes you an officer in the military and I think pays you a stipend while you're going to medical school. Right. So it's a, it's a good deal. Uh, of course, you owe them some time uh, in the military to serve the armed, armed forces as a physician. But I think those are good ways. Uh, and as Flash mentioned, the loans, I think almost any medical student can wind up uh, qualifying for federal loans. Uh, the interest rates are probably higher than the going interest rates now uh, in terms of savings accounts and things like that. But you'll definitely be able to pay for it and it typically takes five to 10 years of practice to pay off your student loans, uh, but you get to be a doctor that way. And so it's, it, I think it's, it's very well worked out. There also are, are things that you can do to um, keep 
keep the size of your loans from ballooning. All right. One, if you attend medical school in a low cost uh, state or community, that's one way to keep your costs lower. Another is if you decide to live at home, that obviously keeps your costs lower. Um, obviously, that might have other costs. Uh, so my kids tell me that you know the rent that you know I, I charge very high high rent, even though they don't pay me a dime. Um, so uh, you know you, you can calculate that one yourselves. Um, you know just the the usual things of uh, keeping expenses down so that you live like a student now and you don't have to live like a student when you're a physician. All right. Um, okay, let's see, we've got another couple of questions here. I hope that helped, Kailena. Okay, is there a limit on how many hours you get for the primary application package? There is no limit. It's a flat rate service. Um, it is an iterative service, so when you, you, know, you approve the personal statement, you move forward on that personal statement. You don't, don't come up with 10 different versions of it, um, but it is a flat rate service. No time. There's no clock ticking on it. Okay. And let's see another question here. Are you familiar with the so-called 32-hour policy? Some schools only look at your most recent 32 hours of classes and their respective GPA. I don't know. Have you, I've never heard of that policy. That doesn't sound right to me. It seems that it would give a very this could give a very distorted view of one's academic record. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Now, Armando has a follow-up question. Would a post -bac program for career-changing candidates help a non-traditional applicant like myself? No prerequisites. Enter a U.S. medical program. Um, Barry, can you click that one, please, first? Sure. Uh, Armando, I... Uh, created and ran a post -bac program for nine years. So uh, I have direct experience with this. Yes, a post -bac program for career changers would help you get the prerequisites and some upper level electives and give you some time to get some clinical experience so that you would be a viable applicant to U.S. medical schools. So yes, that's, I think that's the route to take. Okay. And I should add that uh, Dr. Rothman, Barry Rothman, has advised many of our clients on informal post -bac programs for themselves or which post -bac program is most appropriate for them. So that's another opportunity. Um, yes, let me just comment. Uh, yeah. Thank you for saying that. Uh, Armando, you can have a DIY, a do-it-yourself post -bac program, which can be the least expensive. Uh, but you need an advisor. So somebody like Flash or me or another accepted consultant could help you. And, you know, the advising time isn't very large. And so it actually doesn't cost huge amounts of money to have somebody uh, guide you through a post -bac, do it yourself post -bac program. Okay. Any other questions? And just to add to Armando's program, uh, comment rather, um, I didn't include, and it was, it's my omission. I have, you know, I have for uh, Herman Gordon, Flash Gordon, I have for other consultants, except that I, I did not include a comments from one of Dr. Rothman's clients, and that was a omission on my part. But Carly sent me one, and I'm going to quote from it because I think it's directly relevant to uh, Armando's comments. And this client wrote, he helped address the barriers to my success. In my case, it was negative thinking taught me how to manage these barriers and modeled appropriate responses. He is a true advisor and partner in this process that you need. It is crystal clear that he cares about and is invested in the success of his clients. I cannot adequately capture how instrumental Dr. Rothman was to my performance as an applicant. I did so well that I was extended an invite that same day as my interview, and I fully credit Dr. Rothman for that achievement. And that's just a small snippet of that particular uh, testimonial. So. I apologize, Barry, for not having it on the slide, but I did want to include it. Another Thank you. question here. You're welcome. If we are a reapplicant and said that we would be retaking a math course in January 2022, for example, but did not do so and plan to take it in summer 22 and apply for this cycle, how do we explain that? Where would you have written 
to his, oh, you know, in other words, you wrote, I understand what you're saying. Okay, so you applied, you said you were going to take it, you didn't take it, and now you're, you're reapplying. Um, tell you what, Flash, do you see that as, a, as an issue? Probably not. Uh, as long as you can show that you fulfill the requirements. Yeah. Um, is there a reason to delay until summer, I guess? Well, I guess the semester's already started at a lot of schools. Um, I don't see it as a big deal. Yeah, it, that's to be negotiated with the school after you're accepted. So, just just take it and get it get it done. <laughs> That'd be my advice. Um, Barry, have anything to add? Just you know, when when change of plans occur, as a general rule, uh, send an email to the schools and let them know that whatever you put on your primary application has changed. Explain why briefly, and then. Uh, I think they'll be okay with it. I think they appreciate uh, being being kept up to date. So it's always a good idea, but keep your emails short. <laughs> yeah, brevity in general is, is appreciated. All right. Um, well, let's see. I want to thank you all very much for your time, your answers, your questions, and your participation. Good luck with your ap application. I have a final story, a thought, and a question that I would appreciate your help with, actually. I also want to thank, again, Dr. Herman Gordon and Dr. Barry Rothman for their assistance with the Q&A. The final story. Sally, who hired accepted to work with her, is an Asian American who had good stats, definitely good stats, and a strong but fairly typical profile. Her consultant coached her through the process, including coaching to overcome shyness in interviews. Here's what Sally wrote after her acceptance. Let's see where it is that. Oops. I'm just going to read it to you, okay? I don't think I would be in the same place today without your help. Out of 20 secondaries, I received 18 interviews. I went to 11. I was accepted to five and waitlisted at four. While obviously Sally's results were great and the most obvious benefit of working with accepted, there was another one, less tangible but no less important. Sally was more confident throughout the process. She was less anxious even during her interviews. She considers herself an introvert and admitted to being quote, very nervous, close quote, about the interviews before she worked with her accepted consultant. So that was a little story. The final thought, we've discussed five essential ingredients that are necessary for you to have a successful medical school application. It's not one or two or even three or four that will do it. You need all five. Sally had all five. Our successful clients have the five and you can too. Get accepted. Now, the question that I have for you, you stayed for the webinar, the pitch, the Q&A, and you certainly seem to be interested in what we here have to say. And I'm curious, if you're not already a client or planning to become a client, would you be willing to share your reasons for not engaging one-on-one -on -one with accepted? And you can do that in the question window or the answer by, or the, or the chat window, I don't care. Anybody want to share? Well, I'll assume that you're all going to be clients and we'll look forward to helping you with your application. <laughs> it's fantastic. Okay. Again, all right. I can't handle the truth. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Uh, biggest issue is financing. I saw a discount, but I think for a student, it's hard to pay off that sum. It is hard to pay off that sum, but it's, it could be more expensive to get rejected. That's the big thing. Carly, could I ask you to post the, um, do we have an ROI calculator for a We don't have that yet. Okay, I can't do it then. Um, there is a firm, we offer a firm, which allows you to pay over 36 months. And there is interest though with a firm. Oh, there is a med school consultant ROI calculator. I made a mistake there, you can check that out. But a firm allows you to pay over 36 months, which really reduces the, the monthly nut. It does charge interest. There's also PayPal credit, which gives you six months to pay with no interest. Okay. So that, that definitely would, would help Roxana. And um, I think those are your best options. 
Good. Linda, there's a question about how do we get the free consultation that we want? Um, I think we will be in touch with all of you because you gave your names. Carly, you have all their names and email addresses, right? Carly is our assistant, our, our invisible assistant. Yes. So you will be contacted um, if you are not contact. Yeah, you'll be contacted. Okay. Then we will be asked to fill out a form and refer to a consultant who will give you the free consultation. Okay. And she wrote all winners. Well, this is for everybody. All winners will receive an email tonight or tomorrow. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Barry, for pointing that out. And again, I look forward to working with um, the, all of you uh, on your applications. Thank you so much for coming, for your time. Good luck with your um, uh, applications. Good luck to all of you. Take care. Have a very good evening. Thank you again, Barry and Flash. You're welcome.